justice with environmental engineering and permitting, uh, aquatic and wetland resources section. Um, today we're going to be going in the field. Request um, for a wetlands delineation. Uh, this is the first step in the process of uh, developing a vacant site. Um, the first thing I typically do, um, this is the site, it's off 196th Avenue in Pembroke Pines. I kind of go through all of these satellite images for the past couple decades, just to make sure, just to get a feel for the site, to see if it's ever been altered. Um, so this site, um, as you can see, it's, it's fairly wooded. It's never been developed. Um, this is the most recent aerials. Um, so we know that it hasn't been changed much for the past few decades at least. Um, the next step, um, I go over to my um, GIS layer. Um, um, this is what we call LIDAR. This particular data set was flown by the state in 2018. Greener areas are a little lower, but for the most part, um, the site is about the same elevation. Uh, when I go out here, I like to check the lower areas first. Um, those tend to be where wetlands are on a property because obviously the lower areas are where the, the water is going to go. And then I also check um, the soil layer. The soil layer was created by NRCS. Um, this whole region has Dania muck and Lauderhill muck. Um, so that's pretty significant and I'll go over that later in the field. So uh, this is the site that we are visiting. You can see it's kind of um, a mix between Malaluka and Australian pine. That's the, the canopy is dominated by these invasive species. Um, it's pretty heavily forested. There's a small path uh, right here that we can access. But for the most part, um, you know, right away, it doesn't really look like a wetland that you would typically think of uh, when you think of a wetland. You know, it's not an open marsh, it's not, you know, a sawgrass, you know, floodplain. Uh, so let's go in there and see what we can find. Since we entered the property, um, it's pretty wet in here. We've had a lot of rains recently. Um, so even though it's flooded, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a wetland. Um, in Florida, we have really two seasons, a wet and a dry season. Uh, typically the winter is drier. So a lot of these wetlands will <coughs> dry up or become ephemeral and our, te our techniques become uh, more forensic. Uh, it makes it a little more difficult to figure out if it's a wetland or not when it's all dried up. Um, but since we're here, um, I'm seeing a lot of wetland plants. We have some sawgrass. Um, I saw some bacopa earlier. Uh, we have a lot of these beak rushes. Um, these are all what we call obligate plants they basically uh, live entirely in wetlands. So when you see a lot, of, uh, a lot of these plants and a lot of the area dominated by these plants, um, you know, it's, it starts giving us evidence that, hey, this is a wetland and it's wet a lot of the year, not just because of a recent rain or something like that. 
So I'm gonna attempt to pull some soil out of here. The soil will give us a better idea of, of what's happening here. Um, it is kind of flooded though, so I'll try to get as, as good as I can get. some cap rock. I didn't get one there. So we'll just have to cut and um, have to find a better spot. Um, the best I could get. It's pretty flooded in there, um, so it was kind of difficult to get one. Um, you can kind of see um, it's pretty dark. There's a small layer of a little lighter material. Um, so let's cut this in half here. So you can see how dark this is. It's basically jet black. Um, the soil color chart is here. We kind of match it up. These two darker colors, um, right here, um, indicate a muck soil. So you can see it's a little darker than that even. Then what we do is a, also is a rub test. So, I'm trying to feel the texture here. It's greasy. It's a little oily. And it kind of uh, stays together when you ribbon it out. When you squeeze it, it kind of ribbons out, stays together. These are all uh, pretty classic characteristics of, uh, of a pure muck soil. So in the office, um, I said the NRCS kind of classified the soil as a muck soil and we have verified that in the field. Um, the reason why we care so much about the muck is that muck, um, muck soils are formed in a very wet place. There's a you know, typically organic material is broken down by microorganisms and those microorganisms uh, can't survive when it's a really wet condition that lacks oxygen. We call that um, an anaerobic environment. So the process here is a lot of this um, leaf litter, organic material builds up over time. It's not really broken down. so. Over time, that turns into uh, a muck or a peat. Uh, right here, this is about as mucky as you can get. Uh, what I'm gonna do next is uh, I'm gonna try to see if we can determine um, the amount of organics in here. So here I've created two balls um, from the same um, core of soil that we were testing earlier. Um, I'm using this one as a control. And I'm going to decant this one to see how much uh, or inorganic soils in here. This will help us further determine if it's muck or not. So typically, um, we got a little bit. You can see there's a a few sand grains in here. Um, so that is a mostly organic soil. 
Uh, sometimes you'd have a pile of sand here or more sand than there was muck. But uh, you can kind of see there's a little sand in here. Here, let me get my knife. So that's really all the sand you got here, all the minerals in the soil. So the soil is mostly organic. Uh, so we verified that it's a muck soil and you can see this is the original ball here. So almost 100% of that is, is pure muck. So based on the soil, the plants, the hydrology, the LiDAR imagery, uh, we can safely determine that, yes, this is indeed a wetland. I'll start off with the, the Malaluca. Um, it's dominating this system here. Um, Malaluca has a very papery bark, you can see. It just pulls apart like paper. Uh, it's one of the worst, it's one of the worst invasive species in Florida. So you can see why it's totally overtaking the system. Um, I also found a uh, swamp bay tree. So it's related to the bay leaves you use in cooking. You can crush the leaf and smell it. It smells like a bay leaf. Um, it also has a, uh, a mid rib here that's kind of got some uh, fuzzy like texture. That's, that's the best way to identify it. Um, this is pretty famous. It's, it's sawgrass. Um, the, the teeth on the blade go one way so you can pull it this way, but if you go the other way, it, it would cut you. And sawgrass, it's actually a sedge, it's not a grass. Um, and then this is called um, water hyssops. It's uh, Bacopa monnieri. This is a wetland plant. Um, this is um, it's called salt bush. It's kind of uh, it's in, it's an in-between plant. Um, we had some cocoa plum in there. Cocoa plum's actually facultative wet, so it spends a lot of its time in water. It's also native. And then we have some beak rush, um, which the way you would identify this is you take these seed, seed heads or akines and you'd have to look at them under a microscope to uh, determine the exact species. But this whole uh, family of species tends to be uh, facultative wet. Uh, so they like to spend their time in, a, in water as well. So the, the plant species here are dominated by wetland plants. Um, that gives you a better idea of uh, the hydro period of this, this site. We determined um, the other site was a wetland and we gave our report back to the developers. Uh, they, they want to proceed, um, they want to turn that wetland into some townhouses. Um, so uh, wetlands are protected across Florida and across the United States. Um, so in order to impact those, you have to mitigate or compensate for the loss of those wetlands somewhere else. There are a few options uh, that can do on-site mitigation. Um, you may see it in your, you know, your, your housing development or your townhouse development or even some larger warehouses. They'll have an on-site mitigation area. Um, another option is you can go to a mitigation bank. Uh, mitigation banks are large areas of land owned by different corporations and they restore wetlands on that site uh, and then you pay into them on a credit system. Um, uh, the third option is to, you can purchase another piece of land and mitigate off-site. So, this is an area that they proposed uh, for off-site mitigation. Um, 
So part of that process is we have to go out to the offsite mitigation area now, and we basically have to grade it based on the quality. Uh, we use UMAM scoring, which is our mitigation assessment method. <laughs> um, it's basically a scoring method based on the hydrology and some other factors. Um, and that, that kind of gives us, uh, you know, how much they would have to mitigate. Um, so this is their offsite mitigation. It's actually pretty similar to the other site. Um, the mitigation is complete. Um, this is a finished mitigation project. project. Um, this is for a windmill reserve, a housing development in Pembroke Pines. Uh, you can see it's more representative of what was originally here. Um, it's, it's basically a, a freshwater marsh. Uh, we have some tree islands in the middle. Um, of different habitats in here. We have some deeper water areas. You can see over here, there's a freshwater marsh. There's some tree islands. There's an upland buffer that goes around it. So um, we, sometimes people question, you know, should we allow wetland impacts? Um, sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it can create a higher quality wetland than what was originally there with more wildlife function, more hydrology function. So in some cases, it is better. Um, part of my job also is inspecting the completed mitigation projects. Um, for instance, I may have to walk out to this tree island to see if there's any invasive species out there. Um, and then I would recommend a treatment um, to the, the property owners. Um, Part of their permitting is they're supposed to have less than 2% of invasive exotic plants out here. Uh, you can see in this area, they recently treated some cattails. Uh, that's what that dead vegetation is. So this one has been uh, pretty, pretty well maintained. Um, you can see there's some Alaluca on the fringes. Uh, that's, that's on another property. Um, but for the most part, uh, this is you know, under 2% invasive exotic species. The coverage of plants is very good. Uh, we've seen some wildlife out here, so habitat function is returned. And uh, I, I would call this a, a successful project. Um, another issue we're having in a lot of these areas is um, recreational vehicles. Um, people come in on the weekends and ride their vehicles through all the marshes and create a lot of damage. Uh, you can see here, this is kind of like a mudding area and someone's part of their exhaust has fallen off. Um, so they leave behind a lot of trash. Uh, they remove a lot of vegetation, alter the topography of the area. They can do a lot of damage. And the people that are on the hook of it uh, for the, the damage are you know the property owners so like i said before the homeowners associations or the warehouses or you know other sorts of developments um and they can cause you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage so that's a big uh issue we're facing right now um hopefully you know with more you know education and public outreach uh we can help uh stop a lot of these issues that we're having